Welcome back to Trending in Education. Mike Palmer here. Very happy to be joined by Jenna Spinelli, who is the host of the Democracy Works podcast. She also founded the Democracy Group, which is a network of podcasts about civic engagement, civil discourse, and democracy. She loves a good story, has spent the past 10 years telling those kinds of stories as a journalist, marketing professional, and has recently become a podcaster. When she's not podcasting, Jenna plans and executes all of the McCourtney Institute's external communication. The McCourtney Institute uh, for Democracy at Penn State is uh, a group that focuses on uh, communication and journalism. And as you can see, Jenna has many different uh, hats that she wears on a regular basis. I'm really interested to talk to her about a course she's uh, providing now around the gig economy. And she's also been uh, thrust into uh, the rapid shift to online instruction, digital instruction uh, from a class that used to be face-to-face. -face. But enough with the introduction. Jenna, welcome to Trending in Education. Thanks for having me, Mike. Happy to be here. Uh, so yeah, quite a lot going on. And um, I'm trying to think where we could begin. I guess one place for us to begin is as someone who has worn many hats in your career. Can you provide a recap of your professional history? Sure. So my background is in journalism. That's what my degree is in. I graduated from college in 2008 and worked at a newspaper for a short period of time, but it's right around the, the last recession. So things were heading south in, in newspapers. So I got laid off and thought, oh, well, I'll go back to Penn State, which is where I, I had uh, gotten my degree. Uh, never thinking that 12 years later, I would still be there. <laughs> but, you know, college towns have a way of, of sucking you in. And it's it's been really great uh, to be able to have a strong foothold in the, the community here. So I worked at various positions throughout the university. I was in admissions for a long time doing recruitment communications. But most recently, as you said, uh, I work as basically a communications team of one for the McCourtney Institute for Democracy, which mm -hmm. is a research center that is one part political science, one part rhetoric, if you want to think about it that way. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, we bring speakers to campus. We have faculty that do research. We have a fellowship program that we run for undergrads. But I spend a lot of my time, uh, as you mentioned in the intro, working on a podcast called Democracy Works, which we produce in partnership with WPSU, the NPR station in central Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. So it is a weekly show. I am one of three hosts. I co-host the show with my two bosses, which is an interesting dynamic <laughs> at times. And uh, I do interviews, which is a great way to use my, my journalism background. But I also you know, have had the final say over what goes in the episode and, and am responsible for promoting the show. And then you also mentioned the Democracy Group, which is a network of podcasts that launched in March of this year. So just before all mm. of the, the COVID craziness set in and we're up to, I believe, 10 or 11 shows right now that are all kind of around these themes. So as you know, the rising tide lifts all boats mentality is really big in podcasting. So yep. we're trying to, to capitalize on that and give listeners a, a dedicated place to go for podcasts that are political, but not partisan, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. It does. Um, so that's kind of my day job. And then I also teach as an adjunct at Penn State in the, the Belisario College of Communications. For a long time, I've taught an introductory writing and reporting class. But this semester, I started teaching a brand new seminar on freelancing in the gig economy, which is drawn from my own experience as a freelance writer over the past decade or so. Yep. Uh, so basically, the students... I, I walk them through the process of creating profiles on Upwork and applying for gigs and hopefully getting some and kind of getting themselves established and kind of thinking in an entrepreneurial way before they graduate. Yeah, so a lot going on there and a lot of breadth to your experience and a lot of relevance, I think, to uh, a show that, that we're trying to produce here, which is about what trends are emerging in learning and education. And, you know, you touched on several of them that I think are relevant here. So one is podcasting, obviously, and we connected through the, the launch of Lyceum, the Lyceum app, which, you know, we had Zachary Davis on the show 
uh, a few weeks back to talk about the launch of Lyceum, which is very cool. Educational podcasting is something we're both interested in, clearly. I am interested in the civic engagement side of the equation too. And, you know, how do you teach that? How do you shape up the content for for your show and for your network? Th- those are really interesting topics that, that I think we can touch on in a bit. But uh, interestingly, you're the, the upside down version of most podcasters whose day jobs are something else. And then their side hustle is the podcast. For you, you're fortunate enough that your your main gig is the podcast and then your side hustle uh, is the adjuncting. I wanted to begin there though, around your class, which sounds super interesting uh, as well, just around teaching students the practical skills they need to engage in the gig economy and the, the, new, the new nature of work nowadays. But, uh, but I'm particularly interested in what it's been like in the last month or so in light of the shelter at home order and what was once a face-to-face classroom delivery model has now shifted to digital delivery. Uh, Can you talk a little bit about how that has changed and and what your experience has been? Yeah, so this is actually kind of a a really perhaps unique circumstance in that the the course is is a one-credit seminar, and when it was was just approved in November of, of last year. I'd been pushing to, to get it approved for a while. As you know, the, the wheels sometimes turn slowly in, in a higher ed. So, so it took a little while for the course to get approved. And I'm like, oh, wow, you know, I really probably won't be ready to teach it until the second half of the semester because I needed the first half of the semester to develop it and figure out, you know, what I was going to do week to week. So I had planned to start the class right after spring break. So that means that I've never met my students Face to face. I had planned the course to deliver it in person, but then while I had, I don't know, two or three months to develop it for face to face delivery, I had about two or three days, it felt like anyway, to develop it for online delivery. Right. Um, so that's, I guess, kind of a blessing and a curse. I mean, in, in some ways, I had never done it face to face, so I didn't. I didn't have that to fall back on, but I also had no precedent. So, mm-hmm. and I'm already pretty familiar with, with Zoom and with our LMS. And it wasn't super difficult to figure out how it would be structurally. I also, I think just by virtue of doing a podcast, I, I like to talk and I've gotten used to talking into a microphone to other people just like you and I are right now. So that was all fine. What I have had the most difficulty replicating, and if any of your listeners have have tips for this, I I would love to hear them. Is so a lot of what I do both in this class and in the other the other classes I've taught, it's walking around the room, looking over students' shoulders as mm-hmm. they're working on things. In my mm-hmm. journalism classes, it's they're they're writing a story or or what have you. This class, they might be working on their upward profile or submitting an application to a gig, mm-hmm. and so I haven't figured out like a really great way way to replicate that in the online environment. I've done various things with breakout rooms, but um, that doesn't seem to be the best use of everyone's time if they're just basically sitting there waiting for me to come into their room and they don't really have any indication. There's no visual cue of when I'm going to come to them versus someone else. So those are the things that I'm thinking through. Yeah, it's super interesting. And not having the precedent, I guess, in some ways did free you up and also being someone who is every day engaged in digital kind of set you up as it being uh, flexible uh, and adaptive in terms of how you deliver the instruction. Had you ever taught online before or was this really your first experience? Yeah, no, I've taught an asynchronous class. So the, the reporting class that I teach in person, I have also taught for Penn State's online arm in an asynchronous format. And any any initial thoughts on the difference between teaching asynchronously versus synchronously? So I do like the fact that I still have some engagement with with the students face to face. I I did feel at times teaching the asynchronous course, I was just this weird cog in a machine. They would turn stuff in and I would send them comments back. So it was all the administrative stuff of, of teaching, but without that student interaction piece that I find very, very enriching. And, you know, I, I understand why asynchronous learning is, is the way it is, particularly for adult learners and folks like that who are, who are learning online, folks in the military, you know, what have you. But 
I did try to even then, you know, incorporate some of those face-to-face -face elements. Like I set up mid-semester check-ins with, with the students one-on-one -on -one in Zoom and try to do some of those things just to, to have that human connection that I think is, is so important. Yeah. And I, you know, that's, that's something that I, I definitely wanted to make sure I still had even in this kind of rapid remote environment. Yeah, and I imagine uh, even more so in light of the, the isolation of sheltering at home, you know, the idea that I can have direct access to a human on the other end who is trying to help me, and even just the ability to be in a, a synchronous experience with other learners, other students who I may have been socializing had we, with, had, we had a face-to-face -face interaction. It's nice to be able to translate some of that into uh, the digital realm, you know, so thoughts on that? So not surprisingly, I, I've used some podcast episodes uh, in my class, various interviews about the gig economy and, and stories of people on Upwork and other platforms. And I found that the, the discussions we had around those episodes were really great and maybe a little bit more robust than they would have been in a face-to-face classroom setting. You know, every instructor, I think, can conjure an image of throwing a question out there and getting those blank stares back. And I, I think students are kind of self-conscious to, to some extent. They're always looking around to see like, okay, well, who else is going to put their hand up? But mm -hmm. you don't have that in the Zoom environment, which is super interesting. There's probably a whole wealth of, of academic research to, to be done on this, how it affects student participation and engagement. I, I think that students may feel more confident about speaking up, um, about raising their hand virtually in Zoom and chiming in. And maybe they've also had more time on their hands to listen to, to podcasts. I, I chose podcasts with the idea that they could do them while you know, they were on the bus or doing their laundry or whatever it is that they were doing. But I mm -hmm. was heartened to hear that they found ways to work them into their new routines as, as they adjusted to sheltering in place. Yeah, that's super interesting as well in that the level to which folks are listening to podcasts and how we all fit that into our lives as our behavioral patterns are changing in, in such fundamental ways. Who knows how they're going to change when we start to hopefully come out on the other side. It's also interesting to me the, the, the social dynamics of your classroom and how, you know, maybe comparing and contrasting the three different types of dynamics that, that you have experience with. On the one hand, you know, teaching a face-to-face -face class, which has in some ways some of the awkwardness of being in the same physical space that, that needs to get navigated through. Then you look at that translated into the emergency remote teaching, ERT is what I, I, I saw in Educause article, which is pretty interesting where it's describing ERT as, as something that's different than traditional online learning. And then the more traditional asynchronous model which is in some ways I, I think a little bit isolating in terms of the, the social dynamics of which you were describing. Any, any initial take on that? Because it's also, you know, I imagine your learners are in some ways craving contact and engagement in a way that their head might not have been there had this been a traditional face-to-face -face where they're in a class and they're like, all right, I got to go through my class experience. So any thoughts on what it feels like either for you or what you think it might feel like for your learners across those different context? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to tell because I didn't have anything with, with this group, I didn't have anything to, to compare it to. So I had not gotten to know them before this, this ERT phase, but I'm just trying to be mindful of what else they might have going on. You know, students have shared with me, you know, I get these emails about, oh, I'm, I'm so sorry that this is late because I had this family circumstance happened mm -hmm. because of, of COVID. So I think just trying to be more mindful of that, um, making myself more more available for, for office hours. I, I hold office hours in Zoom. And one of the things that kind of went through my mind initially when I was uh, preparing for this ERT was, okay, how can I use this to show the students how to use Calendly and how to use some of these other tools that if they end, end up becoming freelancers or side hustlers themselves, they're going to have to figure out how to use. So how mm -hmm. can I try to incorporate those as, as learning moments into how the course is structured? The other thing I've been trying to keep in mind as, as far as engagement goes is that going back to that that face-to-face setting and you know what I was saying before about getting those blank stares like if I did a, a 
classroom discussion of with 20 students and three or four of them talk, I would consider that a success. Mm -hmm. And so making sure that that carries over to the ERT format, not having expectations that are like artificially high, that mm -hmm. everyone's going to participate or engage in some way. And, you know, if, if they don't have their video on, I, I have to assume that they're, they're paying attention and not right. doing something else. But that's just as easy, frankly, to do in an in-person setting. You know, I watch students all the time on their phones, or I mostly teach in computer labs where they kind of hide down behind their screens. And I don't know what they're doing <laughs> back there. I hope they're listening to what I have to say, but you just have to kind of learn to, to let a lot of that go. And so that's, that's been helpful too, having already kind of gone through some of that in the, the physical classroom. Yeah, and it's it's super interesting to think about how new norms can be established around social engagement through synchronous online that I think are still being established. Because to your previous point, you know, this emergency response, emergency remote teaching, I think is becoming this massive learning lab where everybody's trying new things. There isn't even enough time yet for folks to compare notes. And uh, I love your your outreach. You know, if anyone out there has ideas, we'd love we'd love to hear them. And uh, Jenna, in particular, would love to hear them. But uh, but I think just establishing more communities of practice around online teaching is something that they've been there, but it's it's generally been it's kind of like a sidelight to what is sort of you know appropriate teaching or traditional models of, of higher education. I feel like this may be a watershed moment in that teaching digitally may no longer be relegated. It, I think at a minimum, it, it'll probably be thought of more on par with teaching in person. And then I imagine depending on the instructor, depending on the course and the context, you know, there will be new opportunities that emerge by virtue of being online. And in particular, I think the opening up access and the reach of your instruction beyond your your physical geography is super super interesting. So, any thoughts on on this? Yeah, here at, here at Penn State, we've always had a, a, a fairly robust ed tech community. There's a, a big conference here called Teaching and Learning with Technology that mm. that happens every spring. And but but you're right; it has always been just kind of this side thing that. You could engage with it if you wanted to, but a lot of people didn't. It wasn't ever really necessary, you know, particularly in, in some disciplines like journalism or, you know, liberal arts or something like that. A lot of still kind of very traditional modes of teaching. But now the, those folks are like, hey, now everybody realizes that we're here and let's try to figure out how we can, can make the most of that and um, still doing as much as they can with a very, very comparatively small team. Mm -hmm. So it'll be also interesting to see how universities respond in terms of, of staffing offices yep. like that. Like, are they going to be adding a bunch of, of ed tech positions moving forward mm -hmm. to, to work with faculty in a concierge type of capacity or, or some type of, you know, model like that to really help them make the most of the, the tools that they have to still meet the educational outcomes that they want to achieve. Yeah, it's definitely a space as uh, someone who's been doing an you know, educational trend spotting show for the last three and a half years. I'm kind of, I'm a little bit overwhelmed by the amount of the number of emerging trends that are suddenly thrust upon us. I did want to extend a little bit into two other aspects of your, your, your background that are really interesting. One is teaching the rising generation around the gig economy. Just in general, what is that, exp I know it sounds like you had to advocate for for getting this built into the course the coursework that that's available to students and then that that then being shifted into online any initial thoughts on that because it does seem like finding gig work is going to be transformed by the pandemic as well so so any thoughts on the the gig economy place and you know we also like to talk about the future of work and trying to prepare the rising generations for what's changing. So it sounds like you think about that a lot. So I'd love to get your perspective. 
Yeah, so I, I definitely do think about all those things. Um, probably too much, <laughs> my, my husband might say. But no, so I, I saw pretty quickly once I really got involved in the gig economy that there was an opportunity for students to really jump in and start building their portfolios. You know, we, we talk a lot about internships and obviously job placement. And those things are, are really important because you want to be able to, to demonstrate that this degree you're paying for is, is worth it. You're getting it particularly at a, at a place like Penn state where we have a lot of, um, connections that are made through through alumni and things like that so i i understand why the the focus is where it is there but i think it had maybe been too singularly focused on internships and jobs and kind of that that trajectory and i thought that there was an opportunity to as as the university began to embrace entrepreneurship more which it which it has started to do over the past couple of years that the the gig economy is is certainly part of that and mm -hmm. even if somebody does work a job somewhere maybe it's it's a part-time communications gig or maybe they have an unpaid internship and instead of going to work at starbucks in the evenings or waiting tables somewhere maybe they do some some gig work you know writing or, or social media or design gig work and they're still kind of getting that professional experience at the, the same time that they're still having that more traditional internship Mm -hmm. So, you know, we do also talk in the course about just some of the, the good and bad of the, the gig economy. I tell them it's not all like sunshine and rainbows. There are some definite downsides and we look at it for more from like the, the critical studies perspective of mm -hmm. the, the lack of, of rights that, that workers have and what some of those trade-offs are in terms of autonomy versus stability and, and those kind of things. But for better or worse, that's the world that we're moving into. And so I think that we should be preparing students to be successful there and to be doing what they can, or at least have it as a tool in their toolbox. Mm -hmm. um, I have some students in the class who already have their own businesses or the, the makings of their own businesses. You know, they're, they're photographers or videographers or things like that. So they might find it helpful for gigs to supplement their business. I think mm -hmm. some others, as I was saying, might find it helpful as, as more of a side hustle how I got into it was when I worked in, in the admissions office, I took a brief detour into like application development or, or configuration. So I helped launch a, a CRM mm -hmm. in the, the department. So there were like two or three years where I wasn't really writing at all. And so I wanted to make sure that I kept those skills going. So yep. it was, you know, work that I was still interested in. So there, there might be students like that too. They don't find a job in their field, but they want to keep their skills fresh. So yep. those are some of the things that I, I, I was and you have been thinking about throughout the course. Yeah, lots to chew on there too. You know, I, as you were talking, I was thinking about beyond the need for, you know, call it Gen Z, who the undergraduate population who's probably the main demographic that you're teaching nowadays in light of this pandemic the nature of work is changing so that the importance of understanding the gig economy and how you might be able to tap into it and how uh, in particular the digital side of the, the gig economy is likely going to be robust in the in the coming months and years as we we sort of start to come out of this so i do think there's maybe broader application than the traditional higher ed instruction just in terms of the skill development for the broader workforce, both in terms of, you know, maybe service economy, like Uber drivers and so forth, but also I think, you know, designers and creative work. And then the second part uh, related is I've talked a few times on the show about the distinction between the gig economy and the passion economy, mm -hmm. where, you know, it sounds like, you know, they're not actually mutually exclusive. And in many, many ways, the reason why it's good to pursue your passion through a side hustle in the gig economy is that, you may not want to give up your day job. So I'd love to get your, your thoughts on, on all of that, because I do think there might be a broader reach to the, the stuff that you're teaching the rising generations. There also may be older students in your class already. And then I'd love to get your perspective on, you know, tying the gig economy to your passion. So any thoughts on that? Yeah, so word about this class is, is starting to spread around campus, and I've had interests from faculty, staff, alumni who mm -hmm. are, are like, hey, can you come and give a talk for our group? So I, I'm thinking about other opportunities and how to 
repackage this this content for other audiences i'm not sure. quite sure what that will look like a, yet i need to kind of get all the way through the semester <laughs> and then maybe it'll be a summer project to, to kind of refashion it but no right. that that interest is is definitely there and i think you're right it will uh, continue to to grow. Seems very prescient right now, but I can guarantee you I did not plan it that way. And then as far as gigs and, and passion, I think about that a lot too. And I, I have said in class that, you know, ideally these gigs that you're taking are not going to feel like work. And I think that you can look at just about any any of the gig, gig economy platforms and find that. You know, there are the people that drive Uber because they just like talking to people or they want to yep. get out of the house or, you know, mm -hmm. all of that. And I think that, I don't know, I'm sure that that kind of extends down the line, but it, it, I think it even applies more so on some of the more professional platforms like Upwork or Fiverr. You have control over what you do or don't apply for, you mm -hmm. know, and you can pick gigs that interest you in terms of what subject matter you're interested in, what skills you want to utilize. Now, depending on your financial situation, you might have to be more flexible or what have you based on your, your income needs, but mm -hmm. you always have the upper hand. And when I first got into it, it's kind of the, the thrill of the chase. You could easily go down the rabbit hole and just like apply for dozens and dozens of things and become completely overwhelmed. So we, we talk about that too, how to avoid burning out. But, and, and I think that the work that I've done on the side has really made me more creative and more innovative at my day job. Just being able to like come into a new situation, understand what's going on, understand what's required. Just even seeing how other sectors and industries do things. You know, higher ed tends to be pretty insular and pretty cyclical as well. So just getting outside of those boxes has been uh, super helpful and I think has really made me pretty nimble and, and quick when it comes to, to launching new projects like I've been able to do with our podcast and with our network. Yeah, and, and that's where I wanted to go next. And related thought, you know, as we, as we head in that direction is the benefit of building your portfolio through the gig economy. Even if you're not paid enough to make ends meet, being paid to do creative work, that then the work itself becomes part of what you can share to get more work, it does become a bit of a flywheel there, which which I've noticed, you know, because <laughs> podcasting is not uh, paying the bills for me, but but in terms of, you know, the networking opportunities, the body of work that I'm generating, I do think there's a real long-term strategic benefit to be part of the maker economy. And frequently that is powered by the gig economy and the, the side hustle. I did want to move there in terms of the other hat, you have, you have plenty of hats. So the other hat that you wear, which is super interesting, super relevant nowadays, particularly if you're trying to not be political, is the democracy works side of things. And again, while we're drinking from the fire hose, it's it's hard to it's hard to understand exactly what the water tastes like nowadays, just because there's so much stuff hitting us. But what's it like trying to understand civic engagement and civil discourse and really trying to elevate the conversation around engaging folks around our political system. It was already complex enough being an election year, and now it's an election year with an unprecedented global pandemic. So thoughts? Yeah, there is a lot out there, as you said, but there's just such an opportunity to, to take a step back and get above the fray of, you know, which politician is saying what or whatever the, the headlines are and think about some of the underlying systems and structures that got us to where we are. Mm -hmm. So we just recorded an episode yesterday all about the concept of, of federalism, which is the breakdown between state and federal power. Super mm -hmm. relevant right now as President Trump is feuding with the governors, but yep. we're not talking about he said, he said, or she said between Trump and, and governors. We're looking at, okay, how did the system get to be this way? What are the pros? What are the cons? Is it going to change moving forward? You know, mm -hmm. These things have are, are fluid and kind of changing over time. And I think that there's also 
more opportunity now for people to get involved with organizations. One of the kind of facets of our democracy being broken in many ways is that there's opportunities to get involved to fix it. So, mm -hmm. you know, gerrymandering, for example, or voting by mail is, is a big one right yep. now. Um, getting money out of politics. There's any number of, of causes out there that people can get involved with and meet others and connect virtually for the time being, but face to face, hopefully uh, at some point soon. And that also builds that sense of, of civic engagement to ideally there are people from a, a broad or at least somewhat broad cross section of, of backgrounds in some of those types of groups. Some are more successful at that than others. But, you know, we try to, on our show, help you know, lift up some of those organizations. I know several of the, the other shows in our network do as well. So trying to help, you know, give the groups that are out there, trying to do some of these reforms, platforms to be able to, to share their work and, and hopefully reach people that are, are concerned and, and interested in learning more, but don't quite know where to start. Sure. Yeah, and a lot going on, as I mentioned in your introduction, and it's been wonderful having you on. We'd love to stay connected. I will, well, maybe just to start, if folks want to understand what you're up to and track down your show or any of this information, what, what's the best place for people to go? Yeah, you can access Democracy Works, which is our podcast at democracyworkspodcast.com. Mm -hmm. the, the network I mentioned of about a dozen different podcasts is at democracygroup.org. Okay. Um, you can also connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, if you just search for Jenna Spinelli, you can mm -hmm. find me there or email me at jenna at psu.edu. Awesome. And, and as we're wrapping up, I always like to ask folks uh, outside of what we just discussed, what trends are more broadly out there that are capturing your attention? In the past, everyone would always say artificial intelligence. And now that it's the uh, COVID-19, I, I think a lot of folks are saying COVID-19. But uh, anything that we haven't talked about that is capturing your attention, that is sort of a rising trend or something to be on the lookout for. You could also reinforce some of the stuff that, you know, we've, we've hit on many different topics in, in our brief conversation so far. But, uh, but anything you want to kind of close with, any, any things that you see on the, the horizon that, that are probably worth uh, us tracking, worth our listeners hearing about? One of the things that I've been thinking about a lot lately is the nature of our interactions with one another is changing and has changed so quickly because of COVID-19. I think we, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but just what is that going to look like moving forward and, and how is that going to affect the types of products that we buy or as my students are asking me now like what types of, of industries or sectors should they be looking in for jobs. Mm -hmm. I'm also super interested in the continued evolution of podcasts in the classroom and how our new semi-permanent online state might present opportunities to get more podcasts into to classrooms or, or in front of students virtually, things like that. And I think that's mm -hmm. why I'm excited about Lyceum. So to bring it all the way back around yeah. to where we started, sure. just what other opportunities are going to spring thinking about um, audio as, as this new medium for learning and what are the kind of benefits that this teaching environment we find ourselves in can bring. Yeah. Great stuff. Jenna Spinelli is uh, the host of the Democracy Works podcast. She has founded the Democracy Group, which is a network of podcasts. She's an adjunct professor, works at the McCourty Institute for Democracy at Penn State. It's been a wonderful conversation, and thanks so much for joining. Oh, um, thanks for having me. And uh, for our listeners, we'll be back again soon. Thanks to you for listening. Mm -hmm.